most of the compute devices we have today have more than one cores. So typical desktop computer has four cores and on the servers we generally have 16 cores or 32 cores or more. To take advantage of this much compute power, we create multiple parallel threads in our application. So we can do that using new thread.start, your thread pool, or fork join pool, and so on and so forth in Java. But creating too many parallel threads can cause a problem. And that is because of how the way Java works. In Java, every thread that you create is actually an operating system thread, which is also called as native thread or kernel threads. So Java itself will have variables for every thread like program counter, Java stacks, the stack frames, and so on and so forth. But for every thread, there'll be a corresponding OS thread, which consumes a lot of memory. That limits the number of parallel threads or number of active threads that you can have in your JVM, that is in your application. So you cannot have tens of thousands of active threads in Java. It will throw an out of memory exception and your program will shut down. And once you have too many threads, there are other problems that come up. So let's say you have a lot of threads and you have a CPU which has only two cores. So every core will have some local cache and let's say this core one is running a version of thread one and the local cache has all the data which is required by thread one. Now, if there are a lot of threads, that means you have to schedule some other thread at some point in time. So let's say here you want to schedule thread three. For that, you'll have to flush the cache. That is, you have to remove all the data which belong to thread one and you have to put all the data which will be required by thread three and then the core one can remove or stop thread one and can start the thread three again when there is a context switch when it switches back to thread one again it has to reverse that operation of flushing the local cache removing all the data for thread three and adding the data for thread one back so that is called data locality so when you have a lot of context switches there is a data locality issue and you have to keep flushing the cache and adding the new cache which adds overhead there is also a problem of scheduling so now if you have hundreds or thousands of threads your os and your jvm will have a scheduling overhead which itself takes a lot of time this issue of having too many threads is even more heightened when you're trying to do io operations so let's say you have a main thread and it's trying to do some operation related to the io it could be a file IO operation, it could be a network operation. Within the network itself, you can have some HTTP call to a microservice, or you can have a, some database operation done. Now, since this is a network operation or a file IO operation, it's gonna take some time. And when it triggers that particular operation, the main thread will go into a wait state. Until that operation is completed, the main thread cannot do anything else, and all your CPU cycles are wasted. Once the network IO or the net file IO is completed, then your thread goes back into a runnable state and it can process the data that was returned by this IO operation. And this problem of having a blocking thread, which does not do any other operations while that operation is being performed, limits your capacity to scale your IO in your apps. So you cannot have thousands and thousands of apps doing IO operations because every one of them will block and your CPU is not being used efficiently. So what you ideally want is a non-blocking IO. So what you want is your main thread triggering the operation and giving it a method saying that, okay, you perform the operation and whenever you're ready with the result, with the data, you call this callback method in a separate thread. Once you have triggered that operation, your main thread will not block and it can keep on performing the subsequent operations. This is what the ideal scenario would be. Secondly, there is also a problem of synchronous API. Suppose here you have a for loop which loops through all the employee IDs and for each employee ID, there are functions which will fetch the employee object for that particular ID. Once you get the employee object, it will fetch the tax rate for that particular employee and so on and so forth. In this case, even though on this thread, we are not performing the actual fetching operation, we are offloading that to our executive service the executive service can give us back a future. A future is sort of a promise where it says that, okay, I do not have the value right now, but when you say future.get, this whole thread will block until that operation is finished by the executive service. And that's the problem. Because now imagine the first ID in the for loop is employee ID one. So until this operation is completed, this entire for loop, this entire thread will be blocked until that 
first employee object is fetched and the same problem will occur when you're trying to fetch the tax rate for that employee again here the tax rate will be fetched for the employee of id1 only after these two operations are completed it can proceed with the other operations and then the for loop can go to the next id which will be id number two so we cannot use this synchronous api when you have non-blocking io so that's the problem problem is the threads are expensive because they're os threads you cannot have tens of thousands of threads in your application and when you have io operations a lot of them there is no other option but to create more threads because each of the thread will go into a blocking state so you cannot reuse that thread and these two problems together limit the ability to scale your application in terms of how many threads or how many tasks you can perform so instead of blocking you want a non-blocking io and to enable that non-blocking io instead of synchronous api you need a asynchronous api asynchronous api is nothing but the callback that we spoke about two slides earlier where we take the same example of fetching the employee then fetching the tax rate and then doing the subsequent operations but here we are using completable future for it in completable future we say supply it asynchronously fetch the employee for that particular id once you have fetched that employee apply the fetch tax rate once you have done the fetch tax rate apply the calculate tax and so on and so forth here the main thread will not stop for any of the operation to be performed it is just an algorithm being mentioned to the completable future so this for loop will be completed very quickly and behind the scenes it will be the responsibility of completable future to maintain all the scheduling of the tasks on particular threads which is generally using folk join pool and this concept of having a callbacks so these are the methods that you are sending it out for mentioning the algorithm that needs to be run and then chaining of those callbacks is very similar to what we do in javascript so that is what is the difference between a synchronous api where you could do future dot get which is a blocking operation and another synchronous api where you pass in the callback methods where you pass in the algorithms or the next steps to be performed and then internally the platform or the framework can take care of scheduling the threads for the non-blocking io part in java 7 java introduced a concept of non-blocking io which is also called as the nio package here there are classes like channels and selectors will not go into the detail of it but it exposes a low level api for operating in an asynchronous and a non-blocking manner for files or sockets which is the network operations like before where we talk about asynchronous api here also it works on the basis of callbacks so here we have a path where we are defining a file and we have this asynchronous file channel using that file when we say file channel dot read we are saying that hey this is the file and this is the buffer the empty buffer that i want you to copy all the contents of this file into this buffer but i'm not going to wait my this particular thread is not going to wait while you copy the contents of the file into the buffer what i instead want you to do is take this callback called the completion handler and whenever you are ready whenever you copied all the data into the buffer you just call my completed method and then i'll use that method to process the data which you have passed to me so in this case you're taking advantage of this non-blocking and asynchronous api where your main thread which is this one will not wait for anything to happen you're just passing in a callback method to be called once the io operation is completed so in servlets you have a limited pool of threads for a single servlet for a servlet typically tomcat has say 200 threads so that means that you can only have maximum of 200 concurrent requests serving but if you want to scale it up to a lot more concurrent request you can use this asynchronous servlet for making a servlet asynchronous all you say is async support is true and then in your do get operation instead of doing a synchronous code instead of saying okay make the network call write that data into the response you can again pass it a callback so you can create this context you can say start asynchronous and you can pass in a callback method in this case the callback is in the form of a runnable here you're passing the callback method and you're saying that make the network call in that run method and once that network call is completed add that data into the response 
this main thread, this servlet thread, which is responsible for serving the web request, is not blocking at all. It will just start this context, and this whole context behind the scenes will start in a new thread. So your main servlet thread gets freed very quickly, and it can serve other web requests. And that's how, even if your thread pool size of servlets is only 200 threads, theoretically, it could operate on much larger set of concurrent requests. Servlet 3.1 went even further, the IO operations related to the request and response. So let's say in the request you want to get some parameter and in the response you want to write some data back. Both of these operations were initially blocking. So when you said request.get parameter or request.get input stream, it used to be a blocking call and your whole servlet thread used to get blocked with servlet 3.1 this input stream has a listener, a callback mechanism where you can say, hey, I'm not going to block for you to complete your IO operation. You do your thing in a separate thread and whenever you're ready, I'm passing you my callback method called on all data read. So once all the data is read, please call this method and I'll do the processing based on that data and write the response. And this whole concept is taken even further and simplified by Spring 5.0 project which is called Webflux. This is also called reactive programming, but we'll not discuss that in this video. Uh, I'll, I have a separate video for that, so we'll discuss that in depth in that video. With Spring Webflux, this whole asynchronous non-blocking thing is very, very easy to implement in terms of the code readability. So here you have a REST controller, which is a servlet in Spring. You have a get mapping, which says that whenever there is this URL triggered, I want you to call, I want you to call this method your user repository in this case let's say this user repository is a database repository for mongodb this user repository will not actually find the user at this particular point in time it will immediately return not the user but a mono object this mono object is spring equivalent of a future it says that okay i am giving you a promise back that Whenever I am ready, I am going to call that promise and fill in that data into that promise. It is not exactly like future because future.get is a blocking operation. And in the future, you have to fetch data, right? You have to say future.get. This is a push operation. So it is saying that whenever I am ready with the data, I am going to push the data into this mono. I will execute your callback method so that you can return the response. If you didn't understand that, that's okay. Uh, we have a new video coming up which will explain that in much more detail. But the point here is this particular thread, servlet thread, which is doing the get mapping, is not a blocking operation. Even though this is a database call and network call, a IO operation, it's not going to wait for this to complete. It's going to immediately complete and it will be ready to serve other requests. And that's how you can scale up your Spring application if you are using Spring Web Flux. So that sounds great. So using a synchronous API and non-blocking IO, you can scale your application a lot more than you were able to before. But there are a few considerations to be made. Of course, there are advantages. Your code is much more CPU efficient. Because the thread handling is done by the framework, it will do the same number of tasks with limited set of threads. That means you have better CPU utilization. Uh, since the threading is taken care of by the framework or the platform itself, there can be less context switches and it can take care of the data locality itself. But all this comes with a lot of issues. The first issue is, I'm sure when you took a look at the code of the servlets, you found it to be a little non-intuitive. And that is why this callback mechanism, especially with chaining and nesting, makes it difficult to write the code and makes it difficult to reason about the code if you're reading someone else's code. It can be equally difficult to debug that code because the stack traces are different than your blocking IO. Your entire flow from say web request to some data processing to the network operation, everything has to be done using non-blocking IO and asynchronous API. So what we really want is we like synchronous programming because it makes it easier to write, makes it easier to reason about. What we really want is something which is more lightweight. We don't want these expensive threads. And that is what this Java Fibers project is all about. This project, officially called Project Loom, is an upcoming Java feature which will allow you to create lightweight threads, which are not the OS level threads, and you can create millions of such threads 
you can write your operations using synchronous API using blocking operations and then if any of your thread blocks it's the responsibility of that Java fiber platform to change that threads and all these millions of threads will be run on a limited set of OS threads so if you have so four CPU cores it is possible that you have only four OS threads but you have millions of Java fiber threads which is the lightweight threads and then it is that platform's responsibility or Java's responsibility to run these lightweight threads on four number of actual threads running on the CPU core. So that's the overview of Java's asynchronous programming. Threads are expensive. You cannot have tens of thousands of threads, especially if you are doing blocking IO network operations, it makes it worse. To solve that, we have non-blocking IO. Not for non-blocking IO, you need asynchronous API, which is based on callbacks which makes your application scale more but on the downside it is very difficult to write such code and write tests for it and debug it that's it for this video thanks a lot for listening and see you in the next one